The state of the Middle East is a catastrophe. And it's not getting any better. The Middle East is on fire. The battle lines are being drawn. The alliance between Moscow and Tehran is a match made in hell. And guess who is in the crosshairs? This has dangerous implications like we have not seen in generations. And then, a 25-year-old faces a terminal diagnosis. God has put dreams in my heart. I can't do that stuff if I'm dead. See how she's miraculously healed on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. A vicious snowstorm is on the way in the Middle East. Uh, not the Middle East, in New Hampshire. Uh, in New Hampshire, there's a hotel, the Mount Washington Hotel. Okay. And it's at the north part of the state. And it's a little place. The voting booth is called Dixville Notch. Dixville Notch. It's the first poll, polling place that is open uh, in uh, the day. So they announced the results of Dixville Notch. Already. Uh, already. <laughs> and so <clears throat> they're hotel employees. So they split for Trump. They split for Casey. And they split for Rubio. I went up there, if you can believe it. And you shake hands with all those cooks. And you think, well, surely one of those cooks will vote for me. Not a single vote <laughs> that I get from Dixville Notch. You came in fifth in New Hampshire, right? I did. I was tied with the governor of Delaware, Pete DuPont. It was terrible. My, my um, campaign manager uh, didn't do his job. And he, he then later confessed that, you know, I didn't do everything. I, I told you I'd done all this stuff, and I did none of it. So it was terrible. But anyhow... Uh, the polls are open. It looks like it's going to be Trump and somebody. And there's a tremendous fight for second place in New Hampshire. What's your, who's your call? Um, Kasich is coming on really strong. He campaigned like crazy up there. He went all over the state, and uh, uh, the, they really respond to him. So we'll see. He's, he, he might come in second. We'll see. Well, Socialist Bernie Sanders will... Um possibly beat Hillary Clinton among the Democrats. The big question for Republicans may not be who will win, but who will finish near the top and stay in the race? David Brody brings us the story from the Granite State. For months, Donald Trump has been the clear front runner in New Hampshire, and if polls ring true, the Donald could see his first primary win. We need the proper leadership and we don't have it now. Second place is a bigger question. Iowa caucus winner Ted Cruz has a shot. His evangelical message played well in Iowa. Here in the live free or die state, he's talking more like a libertarian. The men and women in this room love this country, love liberty, love the Constitution. The men and women in this room, I believe, I know, will crawl over broken glass with a knife between your teeth fighting to save this country. Marco Rubio, a strong third finisher in Iowa, would be very happy with second in New Hampshire. Negative reviews from his weekend debate performance, however, could lead to a possible slide. He was criticized for continually repeating a rehearsed attack line against President Obama. But Rubio says he's moving on. Oh, why do you keep saying the same thing about Obama trying to change America? I'm going to keep saying that a million times because I believe it's true. The political terrain here in New Hampshire is much different than that of Iowa. In New Hampshire, they're talking more about economic solutions rather than the fiery rhetoric on social issues in Iowa. And that means more candidates have emerged here in the Granite State. One of them is John Kasich. He's spending a lot of time here. As a matter of fact, he's done over 100 town halls because he's hoping to strike it big. Kasich wants to be the candidate of common sense solutions, and he's preaching compassionate conservatism, too. When we listen to one another and help one another, we make such a stronger and better world, don't we? And a more beautiful world. Two other governor types, Jeb Bush and Chris Christie, also want to be seen as an alternative to Trump or Cruz. It's worth watching which one gets noticed. For Democrats, Bernie Sanders is positioned for victory over Hillary Clinton. His socialist talk appeals to the left-leaning crowd up here. We will see if it's a match made in political heaven. There is clear interest with a record turnout in Iowa, and state officials here expect record-breaking totals, too. As for the outcome, the Granite State can be unpredictable because nearly half of all voters are either undeclared or independent. 
That means they can vote Republican or Democrat, and many won't decide until the last moment. There's a lot of good candidates, but I've, I've whittled it down to, to three, three to four candidates right now. I'm actually going to go back and uh, YouTube Saturday night's debate and rewatch the, 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 the 90 minutes again. Tonight, voters like that will likely write the next chapter in this presidential novel. David Brody, CBN News, in Manchester, New Hampshire. Well, when I was up there, it was known as a conservative state. Live free or die. And there were big things that said, this is Reagan country. Uh, Ronald Reagan is the one who said, you know, I paid for that microphone. And that was the line that won him the uh, uh, election up there in New Hampshire. Um, it's, it's an interesting state, but um, because so many people have moved over from Massachusetts, more left wing, if I can use that term, uh, usually the governor of Massachusetts has an edge in New Hampshire, and those in the southern tier down around Nashua are much more liberal than those up in the North Country, but there's just that many, not that many people in the North Country. So it isn't quite like it used to be, but. Uh, We'll see what happens, whether it actually represents America or whether it's an outlier. We don't know yet. But whoever the next president is, he or she will have to deal with big federal deficit left behind by President Obama. Now, that president is trying to, quote, cut the deficit by raising taxes, but the amount of money he wants to spend is monumental. John Jessup has that story. Pat, President Obama introduces his 2017 federal budget today, and with the deficit projected to climb back above $4 trillion, it does include some new taxes. The budget comes in above $4 trillion, and one of the tax increases is a $10 fee per barrel of oil. The president says some of that money would go for research for clean transportation projects and new energy sources. The budget is also certain to include new taxes on businesses and wealthier Americans. Today's release coincides with the New Hampshire primary, a day on which it will get little attention. Well, the clashes between religious freedom and gay rights have been on the rise in recent years, and the trend may still increase after the Supreme Court's legalization of same-sex marriage. Right now, more than a dozen state legislatures are moving to protect the religious freedom of their citizens. Chuck Holton brings us this look at the work to protect those rights in West Virginia. West Virginians take their religious liberties and their religious rights very seriously, and they want to see us ensure that those are protected. It might be snowy outside here in Charleston, West Virginia, but it's heating up inside the state capitol. The state house is taking up a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, similar to the one that caused so much controversy in Indiana in 2015. Tim Armstead is Speaker of the House in West Virginia. It's not creating a new right. It's not taking away anyone's rights. It's just restating what our Constitution already guarantees and what truly natural laws and, and God-given rights are in our country. People of West Virginia have just had enough, and they're reacting to this big government overreach in every area of our lives. John O'Neill is a former basketball coach who has served in the state legislature since 2011. We believe that West Virginians should be free to, to live and work according to their faith without being in danger of being punished by their government. O'Neill points out the Constitution's language is clear. It doesn't guarantee uh, anyone's right to not be offended. It doesn't guarantee anyone's right to uh, have any particular kind of lifestyle or behavior protected, but, uh, but it guarantees the free exercise of religion. That freedom has been severely curtailed in recent years with the growth of gay rights and mandated contraception coverage under Obamacare, among other things. But these politicians believe the time is right for the mountain state to push back. In January of 2011, when I was elected, there were 35 Republican members out of 100, and today there are 64. Without a doubt, most West Virginians are very disappointed in the war on West Virginia jobs and the war on West Virginia values. O'Neill knows it will be controversial. Well, I fully expect that there'll be uh, a spirited opposition. This happens any time that people try to stand up for constitutional freedoms and, and really to, to take a stand for faith and values issues. Various groups want the bill to become law and recently came to the Capitol from across the state to show their support. We definitely have the... Uh, the support of the majority of our members, and I think the overwhelming majority of our members, then it'll be up to the governor to determine if he's going to sign this bill. He could let it become law without a signature, or he could veto it. And if he chooses to veto the bill, then we'll go to work right away to overturn the veto, because in West Virginia, 
uh, it only requires a simple majority to override a governor's veto. So we believe if we've got the votes to pass the bill, we've got the votes to override the veto. 21 states now have laws on the books that limit the government's ability to punish people for living out their faith in public. But opponents of these bills say that they provide an avenue for discrimination. And these two contradictory worldviews are not going to be reconciled easily. We would certainly appreciate the prayers of the people across this country that we will do what's right and show the courage that's needed to take this across the finish line. From Charleston, West Virginia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Pat, it sure looks like the bill is well on its way to pass the state house. Hey, I was born in Lexington, Virginia, right near the West Virginia border. And you worked in West Virginia for the governor. Are you proud of your folks I'm over there? I'm so proud. West Virginia leading the way. Hey. Whereas, you know, we're con there are a lot of Democrats in West yeah, Virginia, as yeah. you know, but they're conservative Democrats. Mm -hmm. And they're usually the the states that vote Republican in the presidential election. But mm -hmm. they're, I'm so proud that they're standing up for our freedoms and, and leading the way. I like good folks. Great folks, sorry, right. West Virginia, we salute you. John. Pat, a wind-driven winter storm that brought several inches of snow to southeastern Massachusetts Monday is now expected to bring snow to other parts of the East Coast. It's the second winter storm in four days to hit the Northeast. And as Ephraim Graham reports, it's leaving its own mark. Monday evening meant digging out in parts of Massachusetts where the latest winter storm brought several inches of snow. In my backyard, they're up to four feet high. But uh, just snow blowing now, it's probably five inches. Uh, pretty much here, we're just chasing the drifts on the coast, but in, inland, I'm sure they're probably getting buried. Earlier in the day, the storm surge flooded waterfront streets. Yeah, it was a lot, a lot higher than usual. Like, um, it was going over the seawall like a few hours before even high tide. Yeah, it's pretty standard, you know, it gets pretty flooded over here. It'll block off that area. The wind-driven snowstorm led to a string of accidents. In Connecticut, a charter bus carrying dozens of passengers from New York City to a Connecticut casino crashed and fell on its side on an icy Interstate 95. At least 30 people were injured, six of them critically. We had a little extricating to do. Uh, we had some guardrails that went through the bus. And the storm is not over. The National Weather Service says northern New England could get four to eight inches of snow by late today or early Wednesday. New York City, Philadelphia and New Jersey could see more snow as well. But by the time the storm ends, eastern Massachusetts and Rhode Island could get up to nine inches of snow. Ephraim Graham, CBN News. Some wild winter weather. Pat, back to you. Well, it's crazy. I don't think that's going to affect the uh, balloting in New Hampshire, from what I gather, but it's uh, just one of those other things. Some people may get, use an excuse to stay home. Wendy? I hope we get some snow down here. Yeah, yeah we, it won't. It will, uh, flurries. We'll just get flurries. I know. All right. Coming up, storm clouds are on the horizon in the Middle East. You're watching the complete catastrophic failure of American foreign policy. You're watching the Islamic State on offense. You're seeing Iran has been rewarded for its belligerent behavior. This is a disaster in the making. So what are the implications of this perfect storm? Chris Mitchell has the chilling report. Stay tuned. The idea of perfect storm means it's just something for the record books. But is it a perfect storm for war? The Middle East has gone through profound changes since the so-called Arab Spring five years ago. But those changes may not be leading to peace. Instead, the region could be headed for a disastrous war, a war that could have consequences for the entire world. Chris Mitchell brings us that alarming story from the city of Jerusalem. In the wake of the Arab Spring, political upheaval led to frightening developments across the Middle East. ISIS terrorists conquered huge areas of Syria and Iraq. Iran struck a landmark nuclear deal with the rest of the world. Russia's military moved into the region, and the two main Islamic rivals, Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shiite Iran, appear on the brink of war. Israel's national security advisor describes the situation in the Middle East right now as a perfect storm. He says the world should look at the overall danger of the situation, 
rather than the individual pieces. That's because what sits in the eye of the storm is the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. The state of the Middle East is a catastrophe right now. The Middle East is on fire. Best-selling author Joel Rosenberg sees a gloomy picture for the year ahead. 2016 uh, is gonna be a very dangerous year because you're watching the complete catastrophic failure of American foreign policy under President Obama. You're watching the Russians and the Iranians try to move into the vacuum of the American retreat. You're watching the Islamic State on offense. You're seeing Iran has been rewarded for its belligerent behavior and now has two pathways to nuclear weapons. This is a disaster in the making. Many believe one of those disasters will result from the nuclear deal with Iran. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas calls it one of the worst diplomatic agreements in U.S. history. Even if Iran follows the deal to the letter, they are going to be a nuclear threshold state in a mere 10 to 15 years, which as Prime Minister Netanyahu said is the blink of an eye in the life of nations. Cotton says it could lead to a nuclear arms race and put the region on the brink of disaster. We are at risk of entering a second nuclear age and the loss of life will be uh, counted not in the tens, not in the thousands, not even the hundreds of thousands, but in the millions. And that loss of life could include U.S. lives because Iran is also developing a ballistic missile program and they also have terrorist groups that are shown they are willing to kill Americans. Another storm on the horizon is the brewing battle between Shiite Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia. The feud hit new heights when the Saudis executed a top Shiite cleric. Executing this guy is meaning like a declaration of war against Iran. Middle East expert Michael Barak doesn't foresee war between the two countries. Instead, he expects rival factions around the region to do the fighting. Actually, we are already witness to the clash between Shia and Sunnis in Yemen, in Iraq, and Syria. It will get worse, and of course. The final piece involves Russia as a major Middle East player. When the country entered the Syrian civil war, it formed an alliance with Iran. That unprecedented coalition poses a greater danger to the Jewish state. The alliance between Moscow and Tehran is a match made in hell. And what you've got now is the two countries are now operating in Syria, um, supposedly against the Islamic State, but it puts them dangerously close to Israel. And the United States, under President Obama, has just thrown up our hands and said, well, you know, whatever, why don't you guys take care of the problem? We are ceding the Middle East over to Moscow and Tehran. This has dangerous implications for the United States and the world and for Israel like we have not seen in, in generations. Given these growing dangers, many believe we may yet see even more historic changes in the region and beyond. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. The biblical basis for some of this discussion is found in the book of the prophet Ezekiel chapter 38. Well, he talks about in the latter days, a coalition coming against Israel that had been regathered from the nations and was living at peace in the land. And uh, the coalition included uh, the Caucasian states, the Turks, um, Sudan, uh, and Iran, and of course, Russia. And all those together seem to be forming up against Israel. But in the meantime, it looks like the Sunni-Shia uh, divide may be uh, exploding before the something with Israel. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking at the uh, North Koreans that just launched a uh, satellite. They actually put a satellite in orbit. And they, they have now intercontinental capabilities that they could launch an intercontinental ballistic missile against us. You've got Iran on the threshold of uh, nuclear power, and uh, uh, then you've got Russia with a huge arsenal of uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, bellicose intentions around uh, the Baltic states, and also around, of course, they're trying to take over as much of Ukraine as they can. And Obama is ceding a lot of the Middle East to this uh, radical group uh, called ISIS. And when it's all said and done, you think, what are you doing? I talked today to, uh, yesterday, excuse me, to a, a very dear friend of mine who's in Congress and who is 
in line to become the next chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. And I, I said to him, look, we've got to have a 500-ship Navy. <clears throat> and he said, that the way they're going, uh, they'll be down to about 250 ships. Um, Obama wants to cut back on the building of ships. Mm -hmm. And uh, when that happens, we will no longer be an international power. We will at best be a regional power, but we won't be unable to uh, uh, extend our force into any distant places in the globe. South China Sea, no way. Uh, Mediterranean Sea, no way. Our Arab Sea, no way. We won't have the force to do it. But uh, that's what's happening with Obama. And this man is, he is dangerous. He is really dangerous. But whether or not he can destroy this country uh, in the next few months that he's got ahead of him and his people uh, will saddle us with so many regulations. But we're looking at a serious, serious uh, economic collapse with no driver, no country strong enough to uh, uh, take on uh, the burdens of the world, unless the United States mans up and does it. Well, so much yeah. for what's happening. But I, the one thing we've got to remember, and I'll say it over and over and over again, God Almighty is on the throne, and He's in charge, and His purposes will stand, <clears throat> regardless of the Iranians, regardless of the Sunnis, the Shias, regardless of the Soviets, regardless of who wants to hurt who. God is going to have his way, and it will come to pass as the Bible says it will. Wendy. Amen. Time to pray. Time to pray it is. <laughs> well, coming up, her liver was failing, but her faith was as strong as ever. I can remember saying to the secretary, you are about to witness the fastest healing of autoimmune hepatitis that you've ever seen in this office. <laughs> and I said, we'll see you in a few weeks. Hear how this woman was cured of an incurable disease when we come back. Coming up later, a civil rights hero. We were working together in order to secure our rights, but it was not easy. It was not easy. The 700 Club celebrates Black History Month later on today's show. Fatine Grisecki was just 25 years old when her body started failing. Her prognosis was grim. And the only reason she's alive today is because of a miracle. Well, all of a sudden, just out of the blue, I started feeling really fatigued. 25-year-old Fatine Grisecki was always ready to take on the day. Now she struggled just to get up in the morning. Coffee could only do so much. The fatigue persisted for weeks, and Fatine got concerned. After like pumping up on coffee enough times and realizing that wasn't you know, getting me over the fatigue hump, I figured that something was going on with my body that was a little bit more serious, potentially. Finally, she went to the doctor and tested positive for autoimmune hepatitis. The disease attacks the liver, and there's no known cure. Fatine was told even with medication, she would need a liver transplant within five years, or she could die. When you're facing death, which I was at the age of 25, you know, really, you have nothing to lose. And I can remember thinking that, like, that I have nothing to lose in believing that my God is the God who heals. In all honesty, it was kind of at that point where I felt like I had a decision to make in my heart. I felt like I had a choice. I was either going to trust in the negative um, assessment or I was going to trust in God. Fatine asked some of her closest friends to pray for healing. In the following months, she not only wrestled with fatigue, she had to battle constant doubt and fear. I can remember thinking, you know, I know God has put dreams in my heart. I know that he's put a dream in my heart to go to the nations. 
I had such a hunger for missions, you know, um, foreign missions. And, and I thought, and this was just a logical thought. I thought, you know, I can't do that stuff if I'm dead. Eventually, the exhaustion was overwhelming. One day after a Bible study, she asked a friend to pray. I just get choked up thinking about it because it was just such a moment. And, and I can remember her laying hands on me and just like praying with everything that she had in her and just contending for her friend, you know? And I can remember in that moment, once again, the presence of God hit me, just hit both of us. You know, we just felt His peace and His presence in such a powerful way. And I could feel the fire of the Holy Spirit. And, and I knew something was happening in that moment. Like I, I felt it not only on the outside, but I felt it on the inside. And I knew something was happening. That armed her with the faith to take on more bad news. At a doctor's appointment, she learned that her liver was showing signs of failing. Still, Fatine trusted God for her healing. Next appointment, and just in a sheer act of like determined faith, I booked my next appointment, and I can remember saying to the secretary, and I think it was more for me <laughs> than for her, I can remember saying to the secretary, you are about to witness the fastest healing of autoimmune hepatitis that you've ever seen in this office. <laughs> and I said, we'll see you in a few weeks. <laughs> and I, and I Three weeks later, Fatine went in for the results of another routine blood test. Moments later, her doctor walked in and read her the report. He took his glasses off and he looked at me, kind of, you know, was perked up in his chair a little bit after looking at the documents. And he said, well, he said, I don't know what you did, but it seems to me that you've got some brand new blood here. And <laughs> it was just an amazing moment, you know, where he said the enzymes, had, something had shifted. And I was like, ah, yay God, you know, it was just this incredible. Fatine was healed. Months. Within a few short months, she was off to the mission field in Liberia, West Africa, just one year after her diagnosis. In the 14 years since, she's had no recurrence of the disease, and her liver is functioning just fine. She's still a missionary and sharing the joy of being a new parent with her husband, Rob. I'm so grateful, you know, like I wouldn't want to go through it again, <laughs> but I'm so grateful that in those early years, I had that battle, you know, that Jesus walked with me through that and, and taught me how to fight the fight of faith. And I don't think you can, you can't put a price on that. You can't, you know, trade that in for anything else. What a marvelous miracle. God is able. Now listen, here's Suzanne who lives in Spicewood, Texas. And uh, Suzanne had a part-time cleaning business. And while doing heavy work, she sprained her back. And she used heat and medication. Nothing worked. And after two weeks, uh, two months of pain, she heard Wendy give a word. You've strained your back, and it's very painful. God is healing that. And before Wendy had finished speaking, the pain in Suzanne's back left never mm -hmm. to return again. Praise the Lord. Well, here's one, Pat. Right. Vivian yeah. of Center, Texas, <laughs> suffered with chronic acid reflux for more than a year. Everything she ate caused immediate discomfort. Medicine didn't help. Then one day, Vivian was watching the 700 Club when she heard you, Pat, give this word. Somebody has acid reflux and you are being healed right now. Vivian knew the word was for her. And since that day, she's been able to eat anything she wants without any trouble. Praise God. All right. Listen, God, I was reading today. You, you, you read in the Bible, it's, 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 it's in there all about God. And uh, <clears throat> it says he can name all the planets, everything up there. There's millions and millions and millions of them. He knows the names of all of them. And he knows you. And he knows your condition. And he knows your diseases. And he knows your trouble. And the big thing is he loves you. So we're going to join hands and we're going to believe God and we're going to see miracles. So I want you to expect a miracle right now. Amen. Father, I join with Wendy. In Jesus' name, I ask for the power of God to come into people's lives. Another acid reflux completely healed in the name of Jesus. A high little hernia being healed in Jesus' name. Take it. 
Wendy. Yes. God is healing cancers right now, and uh, especially people with blood cancer. And for many, this is a spirit of infirmity that you can cast out and take yes. authority over. In the name of Jesus, just command it to leave. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis, muscle disease, muscle pain, the Lord is healing that right now in an instant. The pain is gone. Just move around and all you see, where's the pain? The pain's gone. It won't come back. Uh, the, you you wh whiplashed your neck really badly and you're having a hard time. You can't even move your, your, your head anymore. Put your hand there in the name of Jesus. Touch. You're healed. Yes. Somebody with a very painful toothache right now and you've got your hand on your face and you're just saying, God, please heal me. And the Lord's touching you right now. Receive it. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit be in people's lives now. In Jesus' name, receive an answer. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise Let us hear from you. We love to have your uh, telephone calls, your letters and everything. Tell us what the Lord has done for you, and we'll just be delighted to receive it. 1-800-759-0700. Wendy. Still ahead, the freedom fighter known as the unidentified white man with Martin Luther King. But here's the thing, he wasn't white. Dr. King got us to realize that hate only provokes hate and that love is the greatest force on earth. Find out how this pastor helped change history when we come back. And welcome back to the 700 Club. An Australian missionary has been released after being held hostage by Islamic terrorists in the West African country of Burkina Faso. Missionary Jocelyn Elliott was set free Sunday, but her husband, Surgeon Ken Elliott, remains captive. I can confirm that Mrs. Jocelyn Elliott has been uh, released to Australian officials in Niger. I spoke with her this morning. She was well, she was relieved, she was very tired. Our overriding concern now is for her husband, Dr. Kenneth Elliott. He has not yet been released. The couple was captured when Islamic terrorists attacked the capital of Burkina Faso, killing 30 people. Al-Qaeda's North African branch claims responsibility for that attack. The Elliots are both in their 80s. They've been running a medical clinic in Burkina Faso for 40 years. A Christian group says NASA has banned the name of Jesus from a daily newsletter at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Like other groups, the JSC Praise and Worship Club puts announcements in the newsletter that is emailed to all employees at the center. In May of last year, the club's insert included the phrase, Jesus is our life. Tarch Starnes or Fox News reports that the Liberty Institute says NASA attorneys inform club leaders the name Jesus is sectarian and including it in the agency's newsletter amounted to an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. The Liberty Institute says banning the name Jesus infringes on employees' freedom of religion. A NASA statement says it does not prohibit the use of religious names in employee newsletters. You can learn more about this story and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It is coming up after this. For years, Reverend Jesse Douglas was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s sidekick. In fact, MLK used to send his light-skinned friend into whites-only diners to order meals. The two marched arm in arm throughout the South. And we want to show you how he and Dr. King also marched their way into history. Dave Kithcart has his story. Its object is one which no American When President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law, it was a day that changed America. Wherever, by clear and objective standards, states and counties are using regulations or laws or tests to deny the right to vote, then they will be struck down. Reverend Jesse Douglas, a co-laborer and friend of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was one of many civil rights leaders fighting for African Americans' right to vote. Really, it was our job to defend their rights and to stand up 
for them to be counted. Douglas helped spearhead the movement to register voters in Alabama, where they faced very strong resistance. We were working together in order to secure our rights, but it was not easy. It was not easy. Tell me about that, about it not being easy. The white people who resented it would appear at places and try to exert their brutalities, you know, spitting on people or slapping them or pushing them down. Despite the brutality, Douglas, like Dr. King, stressed nonviolent protest as a means to demonstrate their opposition to the status quo. The approach that you talked about with nonviolence and from a Christian perspective, how did you get people convinced to go that route when it goes against human nature? Well, the persons who participated had to sign papers promising that they would not violate our non-violent procedure of demonstration. Dr. King got us to realize that hate only provokes hate, that violence only provokes violence, and that uh, love is the greatest force on earth. That philosophy would be tested on March 7th, 1965. 600 peaceful demonstrators gathered in Selma, Alabama to march 50 miles to Montgomery, the state capital. But on the far side of the Edwin Pettus Bridge, just outside of Selma, state troopers blocked the marchers and attacked them with billy clubs and tear gas. The national media covered this travesty that became known as Bloody Sunday. The eyes of the nation had been drawn to that situation as a result of the brutality exerted on the people of Selma. Then on March 25th, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., with Reverend Douglas at his side, led over 25,000 protesters to Montgomery. This time, by order of the president, they marched under the protection of the federal government. Five months later, President Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 into law, giving African Americans the right to vote without facing discrimination at the state and local levels. It was a major step toward racial equality, but the fight was far from over. It took time and some people died. Oh yes, yeah, well we anticipated that, but they were doing it for the benefit of their children and their children's children. And they made up in their mind that they were willing to sacrifice their lives. One of those sacrifices devastated Douglas and their cause. On April 4th, 1968, Dr. King was shot and killed at a hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. The news struck me like somebody had taken a dagger and pierced me in the heart. I couldn't react. I guess it was one of the greatest hurt that I've ever had in my life. <laughs> Thank you. I love the man. <laughs> it has seemed like what was being fought for went with him. It did halt the movement for a while because everybody was in mourning. The nation was in mourning. Over the years, Douglas has continued fighting for the rights of African Americans. He's also been a devoted family man and pastor. Now 85, he fondly remembers his time spent with Dr. King as they envisioned an America where everyone is treated equally. Before he preached, before he spoke, I would sing his favorite song, which was, I told Jesus it would be all right if he changed my name. What does that mean? When your name is changed, you're changed from a sinner to a saint, and you become committed to Christ and his mission. You're a changed person, you've been born again. Oh, I told Jesus. It would be all right 
if he changed my name. What a story, Pat. I'm speechless. Yeah. That is incredible. Tremendous courage. You know, those people, it, it took tremendous courage to do what they did. And they broke through. And I, I think uh, if some of the rabble rousers leave things alone, I think that we'll have harmony in the races. That's what people mm -hmm. want now. And I, th I think uh, the barriers have certainly been knocked down legally. Well, I'm, that's just a beautiful story. It really was. Thanks, David. Well, still to come, another session of Ask Pat. Here's a question from Lori. How do you hear the voice of God? And do you know he spoke to you? Pat will answer that and more when we come back. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Well, today, many Holocaust survivors in Israel live in poverty. That's why CBN Israel is there to meet the needs of these elderly people, from food to medical care and weekly visits to keep them company. Take a look. Ines Gerskaya often spends her days alone in her apartment in Sofed, Israel. She's a Holocaust survivor from Belarus. Her earliest memories are of Nazi tanks and her mother's last words. Bombs were falling as we ran, and the city was on fire. A young boy was killed right in front of me. I remember my mother stopped, hugged me, and said, I will not see you again. I only understood what that meant later. Her mother was taken away by Nazis, shot and killed. She and her three siblings survived as orphans in a ghetto in Minsk. We were constantly hungry. Our clothes were rags and we had no shoes. To this day, I still have problems with pain in my feet from running through the broken streets and the snow. She survived with the help of a Christian man he smuggled her from house to house in the back of a horse-drawn cart as the Nazi SS hunted Jews in hiding. That man took a great risk. He saved my life. Years after the war, Ennis moved to Israel to begin a new life. When I met her, I could see she still carries the pain of everything she went through. It's difficult to walk sometimes, and the winters are especially hard on me. I am cold, and my feet ache so much. So CBN bought Ennis a foot spa and soaking salts from the Dead Sea. I love the foot bath. It's very soothing and helps relieve the pain. It was very sweet of you to give that to me. I feel like I could run a marathon. CBN Israel also got Ennis a portable heater she can keep next to her in the winter. We take her groceries every week to make sure she eats well and to keep her company. The good food helps so much, and it means even more that it's brought by people who care about me. Thank you very much for all you do for me and the other survivors. You're keeping our memories alive so that our stories are not just pages in a history book. God bless her. Well, if you'd like to help people in Israel and around the world, it's so easy. All you have to do is join the 700 Club. It's just 65 cents a day, $20 a month to literally change the world. And when you do that, we want to bless you with Pat's great new teaching. It's called Heaven, What God Has Prepared for Those Who Love Him. This is a DVD. It's got amazing stories of people who've died, seen heaven, and come back to tell us about it. It's incredible. If you're a skeptic or if you believe in heaven, but you just have a lot of questions about it, it's all in here. And this is our gift to you when you call right now the number on your screen, 1-800-759-0700. Well, without right. a further ado, let's, get on let's with it. go to the questions. Lori right. says, how do you hear the voice of God and how do you know that he spoke to you? Good question, Lori. Well, the book of Hebrews, it says those who through reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern good from evil. There is no substitute for practicing the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And we all miss it. We all, you know, <clears throat> we see through a glass darkly. Uh, <clears throat> then we're going to see face to face. We hear uh, in part. So how do you know? You, you know, among other things, the voice of God has got to coincide with the Bible. And if it doesn't, you know you're hearing something wrong. 
What else? All right, Victor says, what is the difference between having a good, healthy self-esteem and being proud? Can't pride in oneself also be a good thing? Victor, that's a tremendous question. I, I think that uh, Jesus said this to us, you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, I mean, that's what it amounts to. And if you don't have any self-esteem, you'll have a hard time reflecting self-esteem on somebody else. So you have to have some feeling inside that you are worth something, you know. Uh, that song that they put out, the, you know, some years ago, I'm a promise, uh, you know, that, that cute little song. Uh, I'm, I'm <clears throat> a great big bundle of joy all wrapped up. I am a promise. And uh, I, I have hope and I am something in God. So that perf perfectly is, is normal. Uh, and it's certainly nothing wrong with thinking if, if you can run a hundred yard dash in nine seconds, then you are fast. <laughs> you know? And you don't say, well, I'm just an old slow poke because you're lying. Um, False but, humility uh, is. Yeah, is, exactly. Yeah. But if you go around, mm -hmm. you know, I knew one young man, and uh, years ago, he was a high school football star. And he never got over it. And it's kind of like, mm. I don't care what you did in high school. I mean, you know, who cares? Were you in the pros? Were you something? You know, and, but don't tell me you're a hot shot because you, you were a halfback in the high school football team. You know, mm -hmm. we've all played high school football, so what? I uh, haven't. I have not played oh, yeah. football. <laughs> well, you've done something. <laughs> but, you know, the idea is uh, to be proud of things like that and, and think that you're mm -hmm. better than somebody else. That's the problem. Well, it reminds right. me of uh, the title of my book, You Are a Prize to Be Won. You Are a Prize <laughs> to Be Won. Beautiful. All right. well, Joyce writes in, on what qualities should a Christian base their decision to vote for the president? I've sought guidance in prayer, but so far haven't gotten a clear answer, and our primary election is not far away. I've narrowed it down to two, but changed my mind from day to day. I can relate. I definitely know who I don't want to be our next president. Uh, you know, I <clears throat> have organizations, and just two of them have about uh, 3,000 employees. And so I have to make decisions along the way. Uh, who would be the best? Mm -hmm. Now, the first thing you look at is character. If, if this person is a liar, uh, mm -hmm. this person is immoral, this person is a drunkard or drug addict, right. uh, you don't want those people. You wouldn't want somebody like that running your government yet, but we've had people who had that low character. and. Uh, the other thing is, you, you've got a task. You want somebody as head of your public relations. Well, do they know how to do it? Mm -hmm. You want somebody as an engineer. Do they know how to make all that equipment work? Uh, you know, you want a lighting expert. Do they know how to set the lights? And do they know what the, the, the shading is involved? And have they got experience? We somehow think we can take somebody off the street and make him the head of the biggest organization in the world. Uh, you, you need to look for, for experience. I, I think you say, what are you looking for? I think we need experience. We've got in there a community organizer who never ran anything in his life. Mm. And we have the failures to go along with it because he doesn't know. All right. Amen. Well, okay. Billy says, did Jesus Christ die a failure? The first time I heard this was from a Muslim. I was not shocked when I heard this from a Muslim, but I was shocked when I heard it from a professor of religion. A failure is outrageous. Mm. Look, what was he here to do? Number one, he was here to tell people about God, about the Father. He was here to demonstrate a sinless life. But more than anything, he had to die. He had to die to pay the price for the sins of mankind. That's why he called himself the Son of Man. He was the representative of humanity who had to die in order to pay the price for all of our sins. You think that's a defeat? That's triumph. And he rose from the dead and he lives forevermore and he's in charge of everything and the uh, 
everything Bowser needed Jesus Christ. He is a winner. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being with us, and thank you. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.